Hello, everyone, and thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is Catherine Orr, and I am the Program Coordinator for the Roundtable Association of Catholic Diocesan Social Action Directors. On behalf of the Board of Directors, I would like to formally welcome all of you and thank you for joining us today for the first of our Fratelli Tutti Dialogue Series. Before we get started, I would like to open us up using Pope Francis's prayer found in Fratelli Tutti. So we could take a moment to quiet our hearts and mind and recognize that we are always in the presence of an ever loving and merciful God. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, Father of our human family, you created all human beings equal in dignity. Pour forth into our hearts a fraternal spirit and inspire in us a dream of renewed encounter, dialogue, justice, and peace. Move us to create healthier societies and a more dignified world, a world without hunger, poverty, violence, and war. May our hearts be open to all the peoples and nations of the earth. May we recognize the goodness and beauty that you have sown in each of us and thus forge bonds of unity, common projects, and shared dreams. And we ask all of this in your holy name, amen. Mm -hmm. the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So there are just two short housekeeping items before we get started. Everyone currently is muted in order to reduce the background noise, so please remain muted throughout the duration of our time together. And then finally, this session is being recorded and a recording will be made available afterwards. So at this point in time, I would like to turn it over to my colleague and fellow Roundtable board member, Joshua Van Cleef, who serves as a coordinator for the Peace and Justice Office in the Diocese of Lexington. Thank you, Catherine. It is my sincere pleasure to introduce our distinguished speakers today, Bishop John Stowe, OFM Conventual of the Diocese of Lexington, and Cardinal Wilton Gregory of the Archdiocese of Washington. Bishop John Stowe was ordained as the third bishop of the Roman Catholic Diocese of Lexington on May 5th, 2015. He was born on April 15th, 1966 in Amherst, Ohio. After a year of community college, he joined the formation program for the, for the conventual Franciscan province of Our Lady of Consolation. He earned bachelor degrees in philosophy and history at St. Louis University, and subsequently earned a master's in divinity and a licentiate in church history from the Jesuit School of Theology in Berkeley, California. Bishop Stowe made his solemn vows on August 1st, 1992, and was ordained to the priesthood on September 16th, 1995. He served in Texas as a pastor, moderator of the Curia, and eventually as chancellor for the Diocese of El Paso. In 2010, he was elected Vicar Provincial of the Province of Our Lady of Consolation and became pastor and rector of the Basilica and National Shrine of Our Lady of Consolation in Cary, Ohio. On March 12, 2015, Pope Francis named him the third bishop of Lexington. He's currently the Episcopal Episcopal Advisor for the Catholic Committee of Appalachia and the Bishop President of Pax Christi USA. Thank you for being here with us today, Bishop Stowe. Good to be with you. His Eminence, Cardinal Wilton Gregory, was born on December 7th, 1947 in Chicago. He attended Quigley Preparatory Seminary and St. Mary of the Lake Seminary. Cardinal Gregory was ordained a priest in the Archdiocese of Chicago in 1973 and later earned a doctorate in sacred liturgy from the Pontifical Liturgical Institute in Rome. He was ordained an auxiliary bishop of Chicago on December 13, 1983, under Cardinal Joseph Bernadette. And in 1994, he was installed as bishop of the Diocese of Belleville, Illinois. Cardinal Gregory has served in many leading roles in the U.S. Church. 
From 2001 to 2004, he was president of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. And under his leadership, the bishops implemented the Charter for the Protection of Children and Young People. In 2004, Pope St. John Paul II appointed Bishop Gregory as the sixth Archbishop of the Archdiocese of Atlanta. And in 2019, Pope Francis appointed him as the seventh Archbishop of the Archdiocese of Washington. On October 25th, 2020, Pope Francis named Archbishop Gregory one of 13 new cardinals from around the world. Cardinal Gregory was elevated by Pope Francis to the College of Cardinals on November 28th, 2020. Cardinal Gregory currently serves as a member of the Vatican Dicastery for the Laity, Family, and Life, and on the Board of Trustees for the Papal Foundation. Additionally, he is the Catholic co-chair of the National Council of Synagogues Consultation for the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. Thank you for being here with us today, Cardinal Gregory. Thank you, Joshua. And finally, I will introduce our moderator, Genevieve Mogé. Genevieve is the Director of Social Concerns for the Archdiocese of Washington. And now I turn it over to you, Genevieve. Thanks, Joshua, for so much of the introductions that you just gave. They were wonderful to, to hear about the breadth and depth of the people, of the gentlemen we get to hear from. This is a promising moment for us, and not just because it's Friday afternoon for some of us. <laughs> I have the pleasure of moving our conversation into the next point in this afternoon. But just real quick for clarification purposes, the outline for the next about 45 minutes that we have is we're gonna hear first each from Bishop Stowe and then Cardinal Gregory. They're gonna be sharing their own reflections and thoughts on the latest encyclical Fratelli Tutti on Fratelli on fraternity and social friendship from Pope Francis. Both Bishop Stowe and Cardinal Gregory are going to share thoughts on the importance of dialogue, noting how and why this is important in our church, our communities, and our nation. After they have each shared their thoughts, we're gonna to move to a question and answer section for our time. So without further delay, Bishop Stowe, Thank you very much. Good to be with all of you. Uh, Cardinal Gregory, this is the first time I see you face to face since that consistory in November. So I heartily congratulate you and know how wonderful you will represent the American church. And I can just tell you, as you already know, how thrilled our parishioners at St. Peter Claver, our African American community are and how proud they are of you. So it's a real honor to be with you this afternoon. Um, I also want to thank all the social action directors under the various titles that you are called in respective dioceses. You're an impressive group of people who serve the church in probably a, a very underappreciated way. You have to deal with some of the co complicated and controversial issues of the day and present our church and its teachings, its faithful tradition for 2,000 years of siding with the poor, of promoting the common good, and sometimes our own church members are not that anxious to hear it. So thank you for what you do. I know the caliber of people like uh, Marie Kenyon in St. Louis or Marco Raposo in El Paso and our own Joshua that you met moments ago. So I just know there are many more that I don't know out there, and I'm really honored to be with you at this forum today. And I'm very happy to talk about Fratelli Tutti, Pope Francis's most recent encyclical that seems like it was delivered just on time for those of us in the church in the United States. Now, when I first came to Lexington, when I was appointed here in 2015, I introduced myself to the diocese as a Franciscan who was trained by Jesuits, schooled by Jesuits, appointed by a Jesuit Pope named Francis. And ever since that time, I have continued to marvel at how Francis is more than just a namesake for Pope Francis. Although he wasn't all that familiar with the Franciscan tradition more than in general ways when he became Pope, that providential name that he chose after being encouraged by a cardinal from Brazil to always remember the poor has manifested itself again and again in the way that he guides and directs the church, in the way that he exercises his universal pastorship. There's more than a connection to St. Francis than his name. 
Fratelli Tutti is the second of his encyclicals to take its name in Italian from the writings of Francis of Assisi. But I would say that even his first apostolic exhortation, the joy of the gospel, and the emphasis on missionary discipleship, which he brought with him from Argentina and his leadership at the Conference of Latin American Bishops in Aparecida, Brazil, that emphasis is so much at home with the vision of Francis of Assisi that we can easily use the adjective Franciscan to describe either the movement of the 13th century state saint or our present pope with little distinction. He released this encyclical on October 4th on the feast of St. Francis after having celebrated mass at the tomb of St. Francis the day before. And in this encyclical, Pope Francis shares the words and the vision of the 13th century saint from Assisi who made a plea for humanity to recognize that we are all brothers and sisters, as the title implies, we are all brothers and sisters in the eyes of God. Now this builds on the previous encyclical, also named from the writings of St. Francis, Laudato Si, in which Pope Francis takes on the poetic and beautiful vision of our responsibility for all creation, and above all, to see the interrelationship of all creation, with humanity being the center and the crown of God's creation, but having responsibility towards all the rest of creation. At this moment in history, the Pope chose to transcend and go beyond his original idea of writing encyclical about the need for interreligious dialogue in a time of so much division in the world. He chose to reflect on the themes of the pandemic and the opportunity that was offered and in too many cases missed by facing this common threat together in what could have been done or what might have been done and hopefully what still is possible. Chapter five, which again arrived for us in the United States just a month away from one of the most bizarre uh, uh, presidential elections that any of us can remember, just a month before that, we receive this encyclical and chapter five focuses on a new kind of politics. He talks about a politics that is entirely ordered to the common good and affirms the dignity of all human beings and the importance of their inclusion in the ordering of society. Pope Francis in chapter five reminds his readers that when Jesus asked what must be, must be done to attain eternal life, he used the parable of the Good Samaritan described earlier in the encyclical, reminding us that we are required to love our neighbor. And even though his questioner wanted to know what is meant by neighbor, in other words, what are the boundaries, what are the limits, who is outside of the circle of neighbor, Jesus instead responded with the well-known parable. Well, Francis opens it up to a deeper and richer interpretation as he looks at all of the context of that parable. And he invites us at this moment in history to ask ourselves and to recognize more fully who our neighbors are. Then he asks us to move beyond neighborliness to actual brothers and sisters and recognize that we are the children of one father in heaven. And he even invites us to consider friendship across political lines, across cultural lines, across racial lines, across so many barriers that we human beings put in the way of each other. The Pope laments in that encyclical how our present structures and lifestyles have not sufficiently brought the world together to resolve the COVID-19 pandemic. In a very perceptive sentence, he says, for all of our hyper-connectivity, we witnessed a fragmentation that made it more difficult to resolve the problems that affect us all. We will need a global community for the healing of the planet from climate change. And in order to combat the other viruses affecting humanity, those of racism, those of radical individualism, those of xenophobia, and to address the widespread suffering in the world. Pope Francis, who he himself described as being selected from the ends of the earth to be the Bishop of Rome, has always pointed us, has always pointed the church towards the periphery. And by his constant attention to the periphery, those on the margins, those on the edges, he has invited us to have an encounter and in that, encounter Christ. 
as he insistent, consistently promotes this encounter with Christ on the margins, Pope Francis integrates the social teaching of the church with its doctrine, with its morality, and with every er other area of the church's life. In this encyclical and in all his writings, Pope Francis gives us a text that is accessible to a much larger audience than those typically addressed by encyclicals. And Francis has the gift and ability to move rather coherently from a description of the world struggling with a global pandemic without the structures to, to unify a global response, to an exegesis of the parable of the Good Shepherd, to a vision for creating a more open and unified world, to an invitation to open hearts and minds to the whole world, and that involves breaking down barriers and borders and really becoming universal neighbors, moving to the practice of social friendship, which changes politics for the common good. In that chapter on global politics, he deconstructs the false understanding of social friendship, changing politics for the common good. He, he deconstructs the false understanding of populism that was so much a feature of the last president in our country, a false understanding of populism to re be replaced by a genuine understanding of people, the people, their cultures, their aspirations, and their long-term needs. He says the church can't pre create a program to meet all those needs, just as in Laudato Si, he argued we can't find our way out of ecological disaster with technology alone. All of it revolves around a conversion of heart. Attitudes and lifestyles are what has to change if we are going to change the social organization and preserve the planet. The marketplace can't solve problems without attention to human dignity. But as the basis for solidarity, an all-inclusive attention to human dignity will make clear the necessity of an international order, an international power structure, which already exists in the world of commerce, and the exercise of charity as political love. And as strange as that sounds to us, political friendship and political love just sound absolutely incomprehensible after what we've experienced and continue to experience in our nation. The Pope illustrates it so simply with the example of an individual, an individual charitably helping an elderly person to cross a river, typical kind of friendship and charity that we are used to, to a politician organizing the construction of a bridge so that all people can get across that river. It is one of his gifts to simplify the message and make it accessible to all people. And he does so in a way that does not minimize the message nor does it take away from his lofty ambitions and zeal to see a world formed according to God's own plan for the world, helping us to move along the path to realizing the fullness of the kingdom of God. What is it that we have to overcome? Those of you who are in social action offices by whatever title face that question on a regular basis. And each place has elements of the problems as well as components for what could be used, brought together for a solution. How do we overcome the things that separate us so much? We'll talk about that more today in the questions that are going to be presented and discussed. We have to begin at least with a commitment to truth to a, and a willingness to, as Pope Francis gives us the example, to see and then judge and then act. I think all of you incorporate that in what you try to do in your own social ministry offices. We have to see with clear eyes what's going on in the world. We have to evaluate it in the light of the gospel and our Christian tradition, our wonderful social uh, teaching. And then we have to encourage the church, inspire the church, motivate the church to act, especially behalf on, of, on behalf of those who are left out on the marginalized, the poor, and the excluded. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bishop Stowe. That was wonderful. I know that I was furiously scribbling notes as you were talking and I just had to shift the paper around. So um, I, I, I'm sure everyone else is taking notes as well. Cardinal Gregory, I now invite you to unmute yourself and to share your thoughts on this seminal document. Thank you, Genevieve. Uh, my dear friends, thank you very much for the time together today 
for this important discussion. It is a privilege to be with you and in a special way with my brother, Bishop Stowe. I would like to express my great appreciation to the Roundtable Association of Diocesan Directors of Social Concerns for your hard work and your dedication in planning this conversation. I know that this exceptional association has supported so many of us with numerous useful resources and expertise over the years. I am pleased to continue to offer my support and to be a part of this important series. We truly find ourselves in a unique moment with the continued coronavirus pandemic that has affected every area of our lives. We are coping with all the ways we are impacted with our physical health, but also our emotional, economic, and spiritual health. Our health as a local and nationwide community has been greatly impacted. One of the most humbling aspects of the pandemic has been witnessing the many men and women of our church who are committed to lifting up and working side by side with those who are in need. Their commitment to advocacy work and dialogue is at the center of this vital outreach to help maintain stability at a time when it is needed the most. The church's social teaching has been on full display in a most powerful way as a tremendous tangible blessing for so many who do not know, who do not have, know how they were going to survive. It is through consistent dialogue that we will continue to reach out and readily respond as needed. In the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of a racial justice reckoning in the United States of America, and in the midst of a highly polarized election cycle, the Holy Father has encouraged us with the release of Fratelli Tutti to guide us in the importance of dialogue and relationship or fraternity with one another. Dialogue and relationship, what Pope Francis calls social friendships or fraternity, are distinct but related theological realities. When starting a new friendship with anyone, our first step is some type of verbal or nonverbal exchange, an initial greeting that begins it all. Dialogue is not a one and done conversation. It is a process, a process of discernment, accompaniment, listening, and exchange. In our world today, I believe this is one of the most common misunderstandings. There is no agreed upon understanding of what is productive and successful dialogue. Dialogue is not defined as everyone expressing the same opinion on an issue. In fact, to not have agreement is perfectly human and is to be expected. However, when we do not agree, we must be mindful of how we express this disagreement, always cautious and careful to not engage in dehumanizing language that creates barriers to reconciliation and reconciliation. We must use our judgment, prudential judgment, in reviewing our sources. Using the Catechism of the Catholic Church to help define these terms, we are encouraged to discern our true good in every circumstance and to choose the right means of achieving it. Dialogue requires we listen as much, if not more than, we speak. When we enter into dialogue with someone, we are opening ourselves up 
to a relationship of some sort. We open ourselves up to the possibility that this initial contact will be the seed of a mutually beneficial exchange. As with all healthy relationships, we are then required to treat our relationship with respect as we show care by deliberately listening with genuine curiosity to understand. Not to convince the other person of our point of view. This can be difficult to remember, but it is nonetheless true. Just as God listens to us, we must listen to others. Fratelli Tutti intends to help us approach dialogue in a supportive way, through the lenses of compassion, integrity, mercy, and the recognition of each person's dignity because they are made in the image of God or imago Dei. For universal fraternity to occur, there is a need to acknowledge the current challenges in our society and recent history. There is a cry from our people for recognition and acknowledgement of the suffering that many have experienced because of the Great Recession, school shootings, systemic racism, including anti-Semitism and is Islamophobia, as well as the current pandemic. Prayer, the work of charity and justice, accountability and unity are essential to working through these challenges. The only way to accomplish this is through meaningful and constant dialogue. We must acknowledge any harm done and be willing to listen to another person to learn how we can be, how we can grow and improve. I do want to be clear, entering into respectful dialogue for the sake of healing and honorable action towards building fraternity and friendship is not without complication and difficulty. What does this look like in our daily lives? The Holy Father reminds us that dialogue calls for perseverance and patience. And he notes that there are moments of silence and suffering. We must be realistic in our endeavors, but also remember that nothing is impossible with God. When we enter into dialogue, seeking friendship and fraternity, we help to build the kingdom of God that is rooted in love, mercy, service, compassion, and faith. As Catholics, as we saw demonstrated in the lives of St. Anselm, St. Thomas Aquinas, and St. John Paul II, we must use faith and reason to guide our lives. As we engage in consistent and important dialogue, we evangelize by using language that is respectful, informed, and charitable. Perhaps this is an area of our lives where we can do some reflection about those encounters we are having either in person or virtually during this pandemic. If we truly recognize that each person is made in the image and likeness of God, then we accept that we must reach out to those who may be different from us. We must dialogue not only with those who look like us or who come from the same culture or socioeconomic background as us, but we must also dialogue and enter into relationship with those who live in poverty or who have special needs and disabilities. We must dialogue with those whose skin is a different color or whose culture or national origin are different than ours. We must dialogue with those in prison, the sick, the elderly, and the homebound. Fratelli Tutti reminds us, of, reminds us why 
we need to listen and always attempt the honest dialogue we are greatly in need of in our country, in our church, in our communities, and sometimes even in our families. At the heart of Fratelli Tutti is the serious task we all face in our Christian witness. We must love our neighbor as ourselves. Let us recommit ourselves to having meaningful dialogue each day with our neighbors in every encounter. We have to bring about the common good intended for all of us. Let us move into the social friendships that exhibit respect and support for one another and that strengthen our commitment to our loving and merciful and triune God. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Cardinal Gregory. Again, I was scribbling furiously as I'm sure everyone else on the call was. That was so rich and I think it is going to move us very easily into the next part of our program for today. We're gonna to be moving into the question and answer part of our time. We've purposely dedicated the, the largest portion of our time together to this section um, because we know that it is gonna be so rich and, and we're gonna be able to pull out some really good um, understandings and learnings from both of you. Each of you are going to be given the opportunity, Bishop Stowe and Cardinal Gregory, to answer some questions. Um, I'll be posing them with a little context beforehand and then um, I'll just immediately direct it to you. So Bishop Stowe, I'm gonna start with you and then when you're finished, uh, Cardinal Gregory, if you just wanna immediately respond or I can repeat the question if that's necessary as well. So both the Diocese of Lexington and the Archdiocese of Washington are diverse Catholic communities. Um, we're diverse geographically, culturally, and also in our political identity. How do you navigate this diversity, honoring Pope Francis's call in Fratelli Tutti for dialogue in this time of division and polarization? Bishop Stowe. Yeah, well, to begin with, I'm really grateful for Cardinal Gregory's words about the importance of dialogue and in what dialogue consists and does not consist. Because one of the things that has struck me so profoundly is that we don't have many opportunities where we're taught how to dialogue. We, we don't even have decent debate anymore, I would say, but we don't really know how to dialogue. We want to convince somebody else of our opinion and are often thinking ahead of what we're going to say rather than actually listening to the other person and it's so rare that we learn to take into context everything that makes up that person, their environment, and why they might think the way they do and express themselves in the way that we do. So I, I think we need to start with the example that Pope Francis gives us and recognize the voices that are least heard in society and start there. I think he's taught us that very profoundly. Every trip that he makes around the world, he gives us that example. And I think each one of us in our local churches can do it. In the pastoral plan for our diocese, um, it struck me that perhaps one of the gifts that our small Catholic community, because we're 3% of population over the 50 counties, and in some places, half of 1% of the population in, in some of the counties. And one of the contributions maybe that we could make is bringing people together and helping them dialogue and teaching what dialogue is all about. So to look at our own context, in, in my diocese, we have a blue sea city of Lexington, which is progressive in many ways. It's the heart of a basketball, the University of Kentucky. It's in the heart of the bourbon country. It's in the heart of horse racing and horse breeding uh, capital. And we have 49 other counties that are largely rural and it's very hard to see, especially the 40 counties that are part of Appalachia, which is a very different culture, which is a very different background, which has a very different history, and to see ourselves as one church in those two different regions. We so say we have Blue City and we have a red diocese all around that city, if we want to put it in political terms, but blue and red doesn't mean anything to us, especially if we have one faith that gathers around one table and celebrates the body and blood of Christ as one family. It's very hard to do without acknowledging those differences and what each has to bring to the table. 
Now, not only those geographical differences, but in our pastoral plan, we also have to look at the refugee and, and immigrant population that are in both of those areas and are often overlooked entirely. They have been faithful to the church. They have continued to um, grow and contribute an energy, a life, a vitality, and youth to the church that we don't see in every sector, but they're not always recognized for that. They're not always heard or listened to. So I think, as the Carter was describing, to teach what dialogue is and then to provide opportunities for dialogue. But that means each of us has to be willing to put down the defenses and really be ready to live and listen and be open to what we might hear. Thank you, Bishop Stowe. Let me start my answer by describing, as Bishop Stowe did, uh, in describing the Diocese of Lexington, let me try to describe the Archdiocese of Washington, especially to those who may not be familiar with this Archdiocese. There are six local jurisdictions within the Archdiocese. St. Mary's, Charles, Calvert, Prince Charles, and Montgomery counties in Maryland, in addition to the city of Washington, D.C. Within these areas, we have the Chesapeake Bay, which has farming and water industries supporting our communities, and we have urban cities and suburbs that contribute to the diversity of our landscape. We have Catholic families in Southern Maryland who are the descendants of those who arrived in the 17th century from England, fleeing Catholic persecution there. And in those same Southern Maryland counties, we have African Americans who are the descendants of slaves in the Maryland state. And some of those African-American Catholics have clung to the faith under extraordinarily oppressive circumstances. And we now have recent refugees, including unaccompanied minors from Central and South America. The church and our Holy Father in Fratelli Tutti calls upon each of us to consider the landscape and the terrain of our communities and ourselves as we work for justice and peace. We must take into consideration the work of the social poets. Pope Francis describes social poets as our neighbors who work to influence the promotion of the common good, the work that builds up our neighborhoods and provides places for community engagement. This is the work that calls us beyond navel-gazing and self-pity into the deliberate action of the Gospels call to love one another as God loves us, or as the prophet Micah reminds us to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. Thank you. Again, I was taking all kinds of notes. This is problematic for moderators all over and I am in solidarity now. Uh, our second question is, uh, Pope Francis writes in Fratelli Tutti, true wisdom demands an encounter with reality. We are in a pivotal time where people are inundated with a variety of media sources and reports. People have multiple sources to consult about what justice looks like, what it means, and how we see see it being lived out in our world, our country, and in our communities. So the question is, in the pursuit of justice and peace in the United States today, what realities or truths much, must the church consider? And I'm going to switch it up and I'm going to ask Cardinal Gregory to, to start this question. Okay. Thank you, Genevieve. Uh, to achieve justice and peace, uh, Pope Francis calls us to do what is good for the whole human family. By working for the common good, we advance together towards an authentic and integral growth of all people. He calls us to solidarity by thinking and acting in terms of community. Solidarity means giving the lives of everyone priority. Solidarity and justice means 
combating the structural causes of poverty and inequality, redeeming the lack of work, health care, and housing, and rework and working to end the denial of social and labor rights to people. May I uh, also add, Fratelli Tutti is the mirror encyclical to Laudato Si. He talks in Laudato Si, he talks about the, the world, the, the globe, the, our common home. And in Fratelli Tutti, he says, now, who lives in that home? And how do we, how do we access uh, ways to, uh, to invite the, the residents of that home to live peaceably, honorably, and mercifully with one another? Bishop Stowe. Yeah, I certainly agree with everything that Cardinal Gregory brought up. I would say that another mention of what we have to pursue in order to establish and promote peace and justice is a, a, an interest in the truth once again. The, the media world that you described in the question uh, doesn't have a lot of, of, of quest for authenticity. And so what sells papers, what creates headlines, what generates controversy, uh, get so much attention, but who is in the pursuit of truth? And I, I think we have to work on that together, and again, with an ear towards those on the peripheries, those on the margin. But we can't just, we can have different opinions, but we can't have different facts. We, we have to have a common starting point if we're ever going to build a culture of justice and peace and, and be able to dialogue and be able to encounter with each other. What we have to overcome is not only the the environmental issues that we face, but the disproportionate uh, suffering from those environmental issues that are faced by people of color, the disproportionate uh, suffering that comes from environmental disasters that are, that is, um, that the poor suffer from more than, than other people. What it means to, to close that divide and recognize our common humanity, it has got to be based in the truth that, that Jesus Christ proclaims to us. So, we need a lot of, of, of teaching about how to get beyond the rhetoric, how to get beyond the polarization, and discover the humanity of each person. Thank you. Our, our third question um, is framed uh, this way. Racism is a grave threat in our nation. The USCCB's document, Open Wide Our Hearts, names racism as a sinful act that violates justice and rejects the dignity of all people. So my question to both of you is how does Fratelli Tutti speak to the Catholic approach in fighting racism? Cardinal Gregory? Uh, Pope Francis refers to racism as a virus that quickly mutates and instead of disappearing, goes into hiding and lurks in waiting. Right now, our country is living through COVID-19. And much like the coronavirus, racism is a virus that is insidious and pervasive. We look to our church for guidance and encouragement. God's love compels us forward to defeat racism. We have many great prophetic prophets leading us by their example. Leaders such as the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King, and most recently, Sister Thea Bowman, who actively engaged their Christian faith and their Catholicism and named the injustice that they saw in their daily lives. We can look to their example of working for equity and justice. We have to do what we have to work to do to act in hope and faith, to recognize God in the face of our neighbor, and to promote a just society. I think one of the issues that we're grappling with at this moment is that people who uh, lived through the civil rights movement and saw some of the uh, achievements, accomplishments that the civil rights leadership provided for us, uh, may be somewhat downhearted because it, with this moment, 
it, it appears that nothing has changed, nothing has uh, improved, and that's not the case. Uh, I have said before, uh, I think one of the, the enduring gifts of this moment, and let's face it, we gotta look hard for gifts of this moment. One of the enduring gifts is that the issue of race has captured the minds and hearts of an awful lot of people. Uh, if you watch television, you see many more faces of people of color, many more uh, of the presence of women in positions of, of responsibility. Uh, you see uh, the entertainment world, the corporate world, the athletic world. They are continuing to highlight this issue. And if that happens, then something good will come from this moment. Thank you, Cardinal. Bishop Stowe? I think very similarly, when we saw this summer, people of African-American background, Caucasian background, a variety of races marching in the streets together and recognizing the injustice after George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and so many other people that witnessed police brutality and killings, to see people come together, it wasn't just an African-American movement. It wasn't just the movement of one group. That is a sign of hope, and it's one of those um, bright moments that we can see, but it's just a beginning. And coming from the majority culture, the dominant culture, I recognize how difficult it is for people like myself to even acknowledge the existence of racism. God forbid you should say something like white privilege because everybody starts comparing themselves and their income and all kinds of other things without looking at the history, without looking at the context, without looking at the ways people have been kept from getting ahead because of the color of their skin or the zip code where they lived or the educational status that they were able to, to reach because of their background. To even acknowledge that is difficult. And then if you say white supremacy, well, even more uh, alarming to people. And Father Brian Massingill challenges us that why does it always have to be white people's comfort that determines what gets talked about? Those are particularly challenging words for me because I know exactly what he means. We can avoid some issues, but there's a portion of the population that can't avoid those issues, that, that lives those issues day in and day out. And I've made the mistake again and again of going to our African-American Catholics and say, well, let's talk about racism until finally they said, you know, we live racism all the time. Why don't you talk about racism? You're the ones that perpetrate it. You're the ones that, that have made it real. It's so important. We kind of almost want the African-American population or our minority populations to fix the problem that they didn't make. So then you get into the structures of well, who defined whiteness and who defines what the dominant culture is. And again, I think Father Massingill's uh, teaching about once you make one culture normative and everything else is different, you've established a kind of supremacy. You've, just, you've, you've set it up for racism. And while many individuals might not believe that one race is superior to another, they're certainly not always willing to, to challenge, to critically examine how they benefited from structures that support them because of the color of their skin. Now, how does the church move us forward? I think opening our hearts is, is a step in the right direction, but it can't be seen as the end. It's got to be just opening up a dialogue. I think the marching in the streets that we saw this summer is a, is a moment that we have to see it. And for Tutti, Tutti, the Pope mentions that Racism is one of those viruses that hides itself, but it's never completely wiped out. It comes back with a new strain, a new variation, and sometimes wreaks some terrible destruction and havoc. We have to be on our guard, but we have to start by acknowledging it and looking into its roots. Thank you so much. This is gonna be our final question, and I don't know if you can believe it or not. Uh, our time is almost to a close. So just going off of what, uh, you both were just saying, I'm going to wrap this up, and, and you both noted that our country has experienced violence and turmoil and division since its founding, and right now we're even reckoning with the aftermath of the recent violence at the Capitol on January 6th, with, which struck at the heart of where we find um, beacons of light in our democracy. So my question is, 
how to this group of diocesan directors from across the country and, and, and people that are engaged in this work, how can we take this moment with the church and help to reimagine its prophetic role of building fraternity and social friendship? I'll let you just sit with that for a second and then Cardinal Gregory, would you like to go first or? Okay. Well, obviously the task in front of us is, uh, it's difficult. And it's, as Bishop Stowe says, it's complex. Uh, this is not a situation or a moment that has an add water and stir solution. Uh, it requires, I think, that we all acknowledge that our hearts have to be changed. This is not a moment when um, we can be satisfied with external uh, projects, as important as they are, uh, and say, if we do this, then the issue uh, is under control. I've written, I've spoken, and I've used this example before. We've seen a rash of uh, dismantling of uh, statues and and monuments that obviously are representative of uh, a racist history, individuals who whose behavior uh, actually uh, established and 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 justified uh, and and institutionalized racism, and so we have statues being removed and monuments being defaced. And that's, that may be very important in, 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 in society. But if we don't change hearts, all we've done is to dismantle a granite statue. And the, the virus of racism simply lingers and endures in the human heart. So this is a moment of metanoia. Uh, and, and all of us are engaged in this. Uh, this is not something that the African-American community can sit back and say, well, let, let the white community change hearts. We have to change our hearts too. Uh, obviously, we come to the issue from different perspectives. But if we're going to treat each other as, as brothers, as fratelli, each brother has to say, and sister has to say, how does my heart need to be changed as well? Bishop Stowe. That, that conversion and change of hearts, Pope Francis teaches us, comes from an encounter. It comes from really facing another person and hearing the other person and entering into their world. And the more that the church can provide opportunities for that, the better off we can be. I, I can think of a, a parish in our diocese that had great success in minimizing some of the ugly rhetoric around immigration a couple years ago, just by inviting people to sit down at a table with an immigrant family and having a bilingual member of the community be there to, as a kind of a buffer and just hear the story, hear the circumstances that these people grew up in. What is it that they were fleeing in their home country? And it was a whole lot more difficult for people to be so anti-immigrant after they knew these people and broke bread with them. And I think that is what the church has to contribute if we, but it takes work, it takes energy, it takes creativity and a desire to make that, that those inroads. I would also say that with all the means of communication that the church operates, and so many of us bishops have all kinds of social media things and dioceses have all this kind of communication. Then we have a private uh, media conglomerates in, in the church that have the name Catholic associated to them. If we don't demonstrate or model some kind of civility, we're not going to be uh, helping the situation. And we have too many of our so-called Catholic media sources lining people up for a fight rather than inviting to an encounter. Now, Pope Francis has also said, you can't have an encounter through a handheld device that has an on and off button. You really have to be face to face. And that's a little harder during the pandemic, but 
look at us. We're finding a way to do it right now, and we can continue to foster those opportunities. Thank you so much, Bishop Stowe and Cardinal Gregory. This was so rich and, and so filling for me personally in my role, and, and I, I'm sure I could echo that sentiment for my colleagues across the country that are here and that were able to listen to your words. It was really heartening, so thank you. I'm gonna turn it over to Catherine, who's gonna give some final instructions and updates, um, but thank you again. This was beautiful. Well, I think like Genevieve articulated, I think I can speak on behalf of everyone here, uh, first and foremost, to really thank you, Cardinal Gregory, and thank you, Bishop Stowe, uh, for sharing your wisdom and your insight uh, with all of us. Um, I know that you, can, you both uh, continue to be a source of inspiration for many of us uh, in the work of social ministry, whether we're in a parish or a diocese or another Catholic organization or an ecumenical organization, trying to build up God's kingdom of justice, love, and peace, uh, which can be difficult uh, nowadays, but uh, leaders like you can continue to be a, a great source of inspiration for us. So thank you both very much. I would also like to thank uh, Genevieve Mojé and Joshua Van Cleef, our fellow colleagues and roundtable members who truly were instru instrumental in developing this event, which is part of the larger roundtable for Tele 2T dialogue series. So more information will be coming uh, shortly on speakers and future dates. So please stay tuned for all of that information because uh, like both uh, Bishop Stowe and Cardinal Gregory said, this really is, you can't have just a, a one-off in terms of dialogue. We really need to continue uh, to find time and create a space where we can share and, and grapple with how to apply the social teachings of our church to our, our particular context. I'd also like to thank the Roundtable Board for their continued efforts uh, to support diocesan and parish social ministers around the country. And finally, I would like to really thank all of our participants for joining us today. Uh, this again was a treat and I know I was delighted uh, to have everyone join and see some familiar faces and familiar names today. Well, to close us out, I would like to use Pope Francis's other prayer found in Fratelli Tutti. And if we just want to collect ourselves and think of all of the wonderful people in our lives who have continued to be a source of inspiration uh, on our journey and offering a prayer of gratitude for our speakers who are here with us today. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Oh God, Trinity of love, from the profound communion of your divine life, pour out upon us a torrent of fraternal love. Grant us the love reflected in the actions of Jesus, in his family of Nazareth and in the early Christian community. Grant that we Christians may live the gospel, discovering Christ in each human being, recognizing him crucified in the sufferings of the abandoned and forgotten of our world, and risen in each brother or sister who makes a new start. Come Holy Spirit, show us your beauty, reflected in all the peoples of the earth, so that we may discover anew that all are important and all are necessary. Different faces of the one humanity that God so loves. Amen. Amen. Well, this concludes our time and I think we are, we did so good on time. So thank you everyone uh, for joining us today. And again, thank you Bishop Stowe, thank you Cardinal Gregory. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. God bless. And I have to say hello to Cat Doyle from Atlanta. <laughs> I was going to say a few <laughs> shout outs. Cat Doyle, Marco Raposo, uh, Marie Kenyon. I was going to say, it's, I know everyone here is very appreciative of, of having you. <laughs> okay, enjoy the rest of the afternoon, everyone. God bless. Thank you. Thank you all.